great to see everybody here uh, after two years of lockdown and COVID. Um, it's nice to be able to get to see old friends and colleagues again. Um, so, a bit about m sort of me. I'm going to talk to you a bit about my background, why I think living walls are, are going to be appearing more and more on the buildings around us, um, what are the fire issues that I perceive and what I've understood from the experts I've spoken to, um, how we've tried to address it from a, a facade engineering perspective, and also what I see are potential next steps for the industry. But I guess that's probably for you guys to, to tell me at the end of this. So, yes, why have green walls? Um, for me, this is somewhere where I go and try and recuperate regularly, which is Hampstead Heath. It's a place where I go and swim and kind of have my bit of nature. And I think, as we all know, and I, and I took the DLR coming here, you see all these towers sprouting up all around, but there's very little nature around them. And that's why I do think we need to address that. And, and that's what we're trying to do as a business. Um, my background's with Arup um, as a structural engineer originally and, and then more recently as a facade engineer. I've led projects such as the Google headquarters, which I'm sure you probably have some fire questions, which I won't be talking about today, but there is a, a lot of timber on that building. Um, and, um, and I've also worked on the Jesus Cross for Sagrada Familia. So I'm used to working tall as well and the implications of, of, of that. Um, and I'm the inventor of the vertical meadow concept. So, this is really, as I kind of show you that first image, a, a passion about bringing nature into cities. And as a facade engineer, I require that to be done in a, a kind of a safe way that I can go to sleep at night. And I guess what's, what's our key kind of key um, points? Uh, biodiversity is, is a massive driver. I talk about sort of well-being, and that, that's something I'll, I'll mention earlier on. But Fundamentally, the key drivers hitting us at the moment are carbon, we all hear about that, and biodiversity is the emerging issue which hit the Environment Bill last year. So this, the importance of bringing nature and kind of all the, the things that we've tried to get rid of in the built environment, um, it's something that I think is going to appear more and more. We've developed two solutions, one which is a, a construction wrap um, and one which is a cladding solution. And, and today I'm going to talk to you principally about the cladding solution, which is obviously more relevant. Um, and I guess, what do we do? What, what, what's different about our approach? I think the key point here is that we grow from seed in place, and that's what distinguishes pretty much us from all the other people almost around the world. There's pretty, we're, we're not aware of any um, system out there where things start growing, and you see that growth in place. And, for us, why do we do that? Um, we are trying to obviously lower the costs of, of green, green walls, but we're also trying to make them more robust because if plants actually germinate and grow there, then that means actually they're the plants that are happy and are, are going to kind of thrive. And the kind of engineer in me also, which is the second point, wanted to build a construction-based system. So I'm going to be showing you some pictures and some, some details of it, um, which I think are very relevant. But I wanted to build off existing construction techniques rather than kind of rebuild um, a kind of a, a new constructive approach because I think for fire reasons as I'll talk about later on that's quite important um, and data that all sounds a bit naff I hate the word data but effectively we're connecting all our systems because one of the other discussions that I'll put to you is obviously the importance of water in a fire situation is key as we all know so having very robust irrigation systems feeding out data it, is another key aspect. Um, 
And I guess the why, I mean, I, I briefly touched on it. My, my personal thing is about sort of bringing greenery in, but, but I think we all know, um, especially of what we've gone through um, in the last sort of few years, greenery is, is the thing that brings us together. I've never seen so many people in the parks in London um, during the lockdown period, and, and there's clear stats on that. Biodiversity, as I mentioned, is an emerging and very important issue. There's a lot of regulation, um, and maybe one of the, the points I'll talk about is how the fire world um, inputs into that regulation. So that's a discussion to be had. Um, and then obviously, sort of people are wanting people are wanting greenery. So the, the idea of branding is for me kind of the last piece that people hopefully are doing it for the other reasons. And then the branding is kind of actually what gets people in there. Um, and I think a good example is one of my favorite buildings actually of, with greenery, um, which is Bosco Verticale, which is an, an Arab building. Um, and I think this building for me really sort of captures this kind of movement towards, I guess, high rise and high density urban living, but bringing greenery in it. And, and this greenery, for me, is really important because actually, as we all know, we're not going to be putting any new parks in cities. There's, there's no space to add greenery on the horizontal. Yes, you should always put it on the roof if you can do, but the, the kind of the next area of domain is, is the vertical, and that's obviously what we're trying to address. We know we want to, I mean, with the exodus of people in the last kind of year or so out of cities, we know that nature is important for us all to kind of hold our sanity um, and, and and that's why I do believe as I and I thought it was rather sobering as I came in I was like actually would I want to live in these new neighborhoods popping up as I come in through um, and, and I think this idea of bringing greenery and doing it in a safe way is fundamental and what we're also seeing I don't know if you've heard the term is urban greening factor so urban greening factor is, is a is a planning requirement in London already I suspect it will start um, appearing in many other cities. It, it started in Berlin um, and, is, and, and is starting really to, to, to drive greening, not just in the horizontal, but also in the vertical. Um, and this is why, as you look at that building and you think of the fire hazards um, of, of that amount of growth, managing that growth and thinking about this at the early stage is something which I'm going to talk about early on, about how we might safely incorporate greenery. Um, the last point, as I mentioned, is biodiversity net gain, which is, a, is now part of, um, now in the Environment Act and should hit the Planning Act next year. So I would suspect we're going to be starting to see a lot more greening coming through your desks in the, the kind of year or two to come. So what, as a, a, as a non-fire engineer, do I perceive the biggest challenge on green walls? Firstly, as a guidance. I think, um, I think we're all conscious that um, there is this document which I've, I've put on the screen, which was in 2013. As far as I understand, there's not any updates um, to that document. Um, so how do we deal with living walls um, on, on buildings? And obviously it covers roofs as well. And I, and I think there is a real gap in knowledge there. And for us, I guess, why are green walls not being treated as a cladding. I'm a, I'm a facade engineer, so for me, it's a facade, it goes on a building. Why is all the regulation associated and all the guidance associated with cladding separated out in this other document? For me, the principles should, should lie together. Again, I'm sure you can talk to me later on about perhaps why that's happened. Um, and I think the other important to note is that living walls are not a steady state material. Everyone talks about the, the kind of the facts of the system, and I'll talk to you about other systems um, being made of plastic, but fundamentally the greenery, which is one of the key combustible components, it's not the only combustible components, but the greenery itself is not a steady state material. So it means that it might be fully wet, the plants might be kind of lush and green, and then there might be the kind of winter season when plants will, will perhaps um, die back, and therefore the amount of water in those plants will vary. And then you've got the extreme circumstance where someone's actually turned off the water on the living wall system, and therefore you've got no water. Um, which then brings me on to the last point on this slide, is how to test them. To be honest, I've, we have tested our system. 
we got um, guidance from Arab on how um, best to do it. So my background being in Arab, they've, they've, we employed them also to, to support us on it. But the question really is, what is the right testing methodology? If I go on to lots of green wall manufacturers' websites out there, they're all stating a, um, a uh, performance. But actually, if I speak to all the um, testing houses in the UK, firstly, they won't give me a certificate for a green wall system because they won't test it as a, as a fully certified test. I am speaking to them about how we might get over that hurdle. But then the question is how to test them. As we all know, whoever has tested any products, do you leave a cavity? Do you not leave a cavity? How big should that cavity be? Obviously, we know the testing should reflect the final construction. So that, that's, that's a fundamental. But as a sort of business, before that project arrives, is what is the right kind of um, testing process? So I'll talk to you a bit about how we did it. I guess the other kind of point is that, I mean, and I've chosen a generic system that hopefully no one knows, because the idea is not uh, to talk about what other people are really doing. But you can see most of them are made out of plastic. Um, systems out there and, and that's because um, living wall systems have typically come out of the landscape world where plastic pots and plastic materials have kind of they're prevalent um, so this is a, a kind of a key kind of thing to consider and I guess um, in your evaluation as, as fire engineers um, and I'm sure as you walked in you might have seen a living wall so you might want to go and look at the living wall um, that, as you come out of Customs House um, tube station and just look at it a bit more as you walk past and, and make your opinion on, on these systems. Um, as I mentioned, plants are combustible, especially when dry. Um, as far as I understand it, there is research out there on kind of um, on the, the variance in combustibility between different plants. I suspect from the testing we've seen, it's it's probably more to do with other plants dry and other plants wet. When they are wet, I'm sure there will be some difference impact, differential kind of, um, I say, combustibility of those plants. However, I, I don't believe that's the kind of, well, the first fundamental issue. I think that's a stepping stone down the line of are the systems fire safe, um, are they installed appropriately, um, and then the kind of managing of water in the system, the water in the plants for me is to kind of step on beyond that. So I guess what are we trying to do differently? Um, so we started the designing of our system, or the, the conceiving this new permanent system in, I guess it was November 20, as part of Innovate UK um, funding on sustainable development. And we put three kind of points to our brief. Um, Firstly, biodiversity. There's no point for me in developing a living wall system that just looks pretty and doesn't do anything for, for the insects um, and, kind of, and nature. Secondly, I know the construction industry, having worked in it for long enough, wasn't going to accept a product that didn't actually um, fit with their existing construction techniques. Um, so, second point. And then finally, which also went in our bid, was fire safety, which is why in the Innovate UK we also included fire testing as part of that project. Um, and that started, well, I mean, for me it was kind of an obvious, as a, fi a facade engineer, fire is, was the thing that's been haunting most of us for the last few years. So um, that was like, well, it, it's not a question. That had to be in that design. And, and that's actually led us to the material choices we have in our system. And um, you can probably start to see on the, the, the kind of right-hand side of the screen our system. And it, it's pretty simple, to be frank. It's a, a metal back um, rain screen with a hinging front rain screen panel. Um, you might recognize the panel in the middle, which actually is made by Rockwell Group, but actually it's Grodan. It's a, it's a, um, it's a mineral wool um, substrate for growing plants. So if you ever try, which we did use some rock wool initially in our systems, we started pouring water on it and it was like, something's not happening here. And um, basically, obviously, the water was pouring off it. And I was like, God, what's going on? And then, obviously, with a bit more expertise and brought in, we, we kind of, um, well, we'd already, we were already aware of the Grow Down product, which is, it's hydrophilic um, rather than hydrophobic. Um, so that's the big difference. So you can see um, uh, the kind of mineral panel.
Tor Building Fire Safety Network delivers high quality safety management training for anyone involved in the fire risk management of high rise or tall buildings. Recognised by the Institution of Fire Engineers, we've been delivering fire safety training since 2011 and many organisations rely on our training for gaining competence in this field. Sign up for our training courses and conferences in 2023. Um, and then we actually, um, on the front of that mineral wall, we have a seed layer. So that seed layer literally is where we put wildflowers. And we're focused on, in this country, native UK wildflowers, but we are looking at projects elsewhere. But we are focusing on wildflowers because of their robustness of species and, and also their limited water use. But I guess going back to the design principles, ah, and you can see a black tube running off, across the top. So that is the only bit of combustible material that we couldn't swap out of our system because it is a pressure compensating um, irrigation drip system. So that sounds very complicated, but it's a leaky pipe. It's a leaky pipe with a bit more complexity, which means actually there's no, there's no um, kind of metal versions. So we, what we agreed was, um, on our installation, we've got vertical metal pipes and all the horizontals are the drip irrigation. So we've only got kind of that plastic in those locations um, because we didn't have any other alternatives. And as I mentioned, it's, it's from looking at the, the, the drawing we have on the left-hand side, it is a rain screen system. And I guess the importance of that rain screen system is that um, you can actually do um, proper cavity barriers to the back of it. It's a metal system. Um, and I'll talk about the fire testing and, and kind of the impact of that cavity in the back. But, but what's, what for, for me was the fundamental point is that you don't need to bring in new constructive systems or fire barrier techniques to actually address fire in the cavity on our system. And, and that was quite very important. As I mentioned, the irrigation system is pretty important. The, the irrigation system, getting all those alarms, having backups, <coughs> having both visual checks and, um, how do you say, system checks, this starts to kind of address some of the issues if it does dry out. And, and I'll talk to you a bit about when it does dry out. Um, the testing of living si wall systems, what we did, we tested it both wet, um, fully grown, and then we tested it where we had turned off the water 10 days earlier, and it was fully dry with a lot of what I think the, the horticultural world calls thatch so effectively a lot of combustible material on the front of it. Um, I'll show you some pictures of the, the, the kind of final um, testing. But I guess before that, just to kind of um, sort of talk to you a bit about it, is that you can see sort of when it's fully lush and growing, we, we're kind of working on the uniformity of growth, but the idea is this is about sort of a much more natural planting um, of the greenery. And, and this for us really is about how to um, um, kind of perhaps bring greenery in a, in a more, I guess, natural way, except that it does change through the year. And that's one of the things I haven't shown you and I should have shown you is that we did a deliberate cut in October where we kind of removed all the thatch that was starting to appear. Um, and that means that you don't have this. I mean, you wouldn't expect to see poppies in winter and that's the reality of our, our systems is that it, it, it relies on flowering through the season, through the species chosen, but this kind of idea of the steady state, which I kind of said and how we test it, is, is really kind of demonstrated, I guess, with these pictures. Um, so now to a bit of fire engineering. Um, I was a bit reluctant to, to kind of put the, the, the kind of test results, because in the end, as I said, they're a bit, until you know exactly what we tested, how we tested it, etc. I think they're potentially misleading, um, to be frank. Um, they were tested in, the, in a configuration with an eight, no, I think it was a 60 or 70 mil cavity at the back of it, um, fully open cavity. Um, and yes, you can see the kind of, um, the picture on the right hand side. Um, as you can kind of clearly see that on, the picture shows that the, the kind of area affected, of the, this was obviously the wet system, just to be clear. Um, the, the area effect was literally above the burning, um, basket, um, probably the wrong term, but um, so 
you can see this kind of vertical strip that was scorched and affected by the heat and by the flames. Um, and for us, this kind of really well demonstrated um, quite well that the lack of spreading with in this current situation of in a wet situation, and this is why I talk about the importance of the state. Um, and then I'll show you a picture of the dry system afterwards. Um, what we noticed in this bit was was that actually, as the, the kind of and we filmed it, and we'll be happy to share um, the information for people. But um, we noticed that kind of the greenery didn't really well. It took it, it, it burned gradually in clumps. I guess what probably happened was it dried out, got dry enough, and then it got sort of hot enough to, to to light up. Again, I'm not the expert on this, and I'm sure I can point you guys towards Arab etc. for more precise knowledge, but as far as we could see, it kind of um, went in clumps, whereas, as you see on the picture here, and we did try and dry out the whole wall, and after 10 days, we were left with still a bit of greenery at the bottom of the dry area. So you can see an area which is slightly less affected, but what you can see elsewhere is this really brown thatch, and um, I guess... What was quite, I mean, for us interesting is, and you can see compared to the other picture, there's been a bit more spreading out of the flames caused by the burning of that, that thatch. And I think for us, this was kind of the interesting thing to learn, actually, is that the system at the end was, as in the components itself, were largely unaffected. I should have put up the drip irrigation tube, but, but as I kind of show it here, the drip irrigation tube was only affected locally. Um, um, where the flames were, so it wasn't a conduit for spread. Actually, as a dry system, I think we need to think about the thatch, um, and that's why, as a system provider, all that discussion about water and alarms is important. But I think it's also important that if water does go off, and I think we've all seen some horrible examples of green walls that are no longer green, that are brown, that actually you've got a plastic, I mean, you've got a plastic matrix typically in those, and therefore you've got a residual risk in that plastic matrix. So for me at that point, as a, as a sort of, I mean, and just so you know, our system is not yet on the market. We're just finalizing its development as we speak. But the contracts we'll be having with people is that if the water system goes off, and we'll be able to tell you within hours of it going off, if you haven't managed to reinstate it, I mean, before those plants start to dry out, then those plants need to be removed immediately. I mean, I think that that's, that's, that's as clear as what it should be. And then you're left with a, a non-combustible, how do you say, um, frame and, and system. But um, that, for me, is the only way really round it. And when people have a combustible system, well, I'll leave it to you guys, when there's a plastic matrix which is not shielded by water, then I think there's, a, there's a, perhaps a good question about actually having to remove that um, until water is reinstated. Um, so because otherwise you, you have an issue. Um, and as I mentioned, the um, Arab did install um, thermocouples at the back of the cavity. And as far as the, the comments were that, well, firstly, it didn't affect the, f um, the spread of flame. Um, but as far as I understood, the temperatures were not that high in that cavity. Um, so yes, I guess what do I, as a non-expert point of view, and I'll, I'll keep saying that, is that um, obviously, the combustible materials for me is the, the issue, especially once it's dried out, something needs to, to be dealt with. Um, I think there does need to be a consensus on the testing approach and a kind of an industry standard way of doing it because as someone who is a facade engineer who knows a lot about testing, there's no clear denominator and, and, and companies can release and put results of fire testing, which again, what, what do they actually mean? Um, and I think this is where, as an industry, this kind of building that knowledge is, is quite important. Um, and that kind of, I guess, links to that last point, is that the guidance and regulation needs to catch up to address all of that. And I have spoken to fire experts about this, and we're really excited to work with the industry to kind of just work out how they can be safely delivered um, and sort of what needs to be done to the systems. Um, I guess we've talked about combustible materials. The other kind of thing that I um, talk about, which is actually about compartments. So I sometimes see living walls, which are very tall living walls, which potentially span between compartments. On the kind of, 
again, as a layman's point of view, from having looked at um, how our system performed dry and wet, that obviously if the wall dries out and you've got, um, you've got our, um, what we call thatch and that all goes up, I think thinking about how that might not go between compartments would definitely be something I would encourage designers to incorporate at an early stage. So actually this is where I think expertise at an early stage. And as we all know, and I've been in the industry a long time, that the kind of architects typically come up with a sketch and the idea right at concept stage and even pre-concept stage. So if they're gonna be bringing greenery in at that early stage, then it's really important that there is a, there's the expertise around the kind of table to actually help them place it um, accordingly, especially if regulation forces them to do it as we, we move forward. Um, obviously, robust cavity barriers, that's quite key. Um, from what I've read about some of the testing previously, that's been some of the issues, um, especially if there is um, combustible material as a backing layer. Um, so how do, you put a, how do you put a cavity barrier um, to the back of that? Um, and then maintenance. Um, I showed you Bosco Verticale right at the beginning, and you think, how the hell do you maintain that? So you know that's maintained through rope access, which as a cladding engineer would be the last thing we would recommend uh, on kind of maintaining. But at the same time, we recognize that it is an emerging method of, of maintaining it. So how do, we, how do we design in maintenance from the beginning to make it easy? So if we do have thatch or combustible material appearing on, those, um, on the living walls, that they can be easily accessed and that can be managed. And I think this is, it seems kind of common sense, um, but I do think obviously that holistic view on how we um, safely bring greenery in needs to be thought about. Um, and yeah, I think that's my last slide. But um, robust design and systems, we've talked about this kind of expert sort of team is kind of key. Um, and I, I guess, um, it requires the whole of the industry to work together. And I think one of the, the best things that I've seen emerge over the last few years, actually, is the kind of connection between the fire engineers, facade engineers, architects, the whole kind of the, the, the positive kind of aspects that have come out is that I do see more collaborative working. So I do, that needs to kind of now move on to the next step. Um, and I know obviously there's chats about how that extends then to the end users, because in the end, the end user chat at the end of this, it's great that we've designed it well and the materials are right, but if someone sticks a barbecue on a balcony or, or whatever, the, the kind of um, all places, um, those fire hazards mentioned in previous kind of slides close to green walls, then the issue has not gone away. So I do think um, that kind of design needs to kind of be brought in at a very early stage. Um, and the kind of the plant person in me says, right plant, right place. So everyone says, can you put plants, etc., cetera, um, on high rise buildings? For me, there's no reason. And I put a, actually a photo of mine from a recent visit to, to France on the tops of cliff faces, but we see lots of plants growing pretty high up. So there's no reason why there shouldn't be plants um, at, on high rise. We all know wind is quite an important aspect. And so wind is um, something that, that kind of needs to be considered. Um, I would never place a living wall on a corner of a building. That seems uh, an obvious place where things will dry out very fast and etc. So again, these are kind of obviously, um, these are things that we need to get or we, we, we need to make sure that the designers coming up with the concepts are fully informed right at the beginning um, on how that's done. And then I guess sort of finally probably is, is about um, getting manufacturers on, on board early um, and work with them to kind of get the best solution out there. I think that's probably a, one of the, the other learnings I've had as a facade engineer that kind of often we're separated from industry um, very early on and actually the best results is actually when we all get together and kind of try and, yeah, try and work together for the best solution. So I think that's it. I did expect questions, but I think they'll be done at the end. So yeah, I expect a barrage of kind of questions on, on how you guys think um, the results um, pan out for the industry. So thank you. <laughs>